Okay. Finally chose the next book to read. Well, next series called The Dark is Rising Sequence. Um, and I last read this in sixth grade. So we're going to see if it holds up. I still remember the prophecy poem from it. Like, I memorized that shit and it's still stuck in my brain. So, I mean, hopefully my fond memories won't be changed by me rereading it as an adult. We will find out. Anyway, uh, first book, Over Sea Under Stone, Chapter 1. Where is he? Barney popped from one foot to the other as he clambered down from the train, peering in vain through the white-faced crowds flooding eagerly to the St. Austell ticket barrier. Oh, I can't see him. Is he there? Of course he's there, Simon said, struggling to clutch a long canvas bundle of his father's fishing rods. He said he'd meet us. With a car. Behind them, the big diesel locomotive hooted like a giant owl, and the train began to move out. Stay where you are a minute, father said from a barricade of suitcases. Mary won't vanish. Let people get clear. Jane sniffed ecstatically. I can smell the sea. Excuse me? For miles from the sea, Simon said loftily. I don't care. I can smell it. Tro six, five miles from St. Austell, great uncle, Mary said. Oh, where is he? Barney still jiggled impatiently on the dusty gray platform, glaring at the disappearing backs that masked his view. Then suddenly he stood still, gazing downwards. Hey, look. They looked. He was staring at a large black suitcase among a forest of shuffling legs. What's so marvelous about that, Jane said. Then they saw that the suitcase had two brown pricked ears and a large waving brown tail. Its owner picked it up and moved away, and the dog which had been behind it was left standing there, alone, looking up and down the platform. He was a long, rangy, lean dog and where the sunlight shafted down his coat, it gleamed dark red. Barney whistled and held out his hand. Darling, no, said his mother plaintively, clutching at a bunch of paintbrushes that sprouted from her pocket like a tuft of celery. But even before Barney whistled, the dog had begun trotting in their direction, swift and determined, as if he were recognizing old friends. He loped round them in a circle, raising his long red muzzle to each in turn, then stopped beside Jane and licked her hand. Isn't he gorgeous? Jane crouched beside him and ruffled his long, silky, the long, silky fur of his neck. Darling, be careful, Mother said. He'll get left behind. He must belong to someone over there. I wish he belonged to us. So does he, Barney said. Look. He scratched the redhead and the dog gave a throaty half-bark of pleasure. No, Father said. The crowds were thinning now, and through the barrier, they could see the clear blue sky out over the trees out over the station yard. His name's on his collar, Jane said, still down beside the dog's neck. She fumbled with the silver tab on the heavy strap. It says Rufus and something else. Troisic. Hey, he comes from the village. But as she looked up, suddenly there were the others were not there. She jumped to her feet and ran after them into the sunshine, seeing in an instant what they had seen. The towering, familiar figure of Great Uncle Mary out in the yard waiting for them. They clustered round him, chattering like squirrels around the base of a tree. Ah, there you are, he said, casually looking down from down at them from beneath his bristling white eyebrows with a slight smile. Cornwall is wonderful, Barney said, bubbling. You haven't seen it yet, said Great Uncle Mary. How are you, Ellen, my dear? He bent and aimed a brief peck at Mother's cheek. He treated her always as though he had forgotten that she had grown up. Although he was not her real uncle, but only a friend of her father, he had been close to the family for so many years that it never occurred to them to wonder where he had come from in the first place. Nobody knew very much about Great Uncle Mary, and nobody ever quite dared to ask. He did not look in the least like his name. He was tall and straight, and with a lot of very thick, wild white hair. In his grim brown face, the nose curved fiercely like a bent bow, and the eyes were deep set and dark. How old he was, nobody knew. Old as the hills, father said, and they felt deep down that this was probably right. There was something about great Uncle Mary that was like the hills or the sea or the sky. Something ancient, but without age or end. Always, wherever he was, unusual things seemed to happen. He would often disappear for a long time and then suddenly come through the Drew's front door as if he had never been away, announcing that he had found a lost valley in South America or a Roman fortress in France or a burned Viking ship buried on the English coast. 
Newspapers would publish enthusiastic stories of what he had done, but by the time the reporters came knocking at the door, Great Uncle Mary would be gone, back to the dusty piece of the university where he taught. They would wake up one morning to go to call him for breakfast and find that he was not there, and then they would hear no more of him until the next time, perhaps months later, that he appeared at the door. It hardly seemed possible that this summer, in the house he had rented for them in Trewisick, they would be with him in one place for four whole weeks. I have no idea if I'm saying the city right. Um, I'm probably not. <laughs> the city glinting... Oh, wow. The sunlight glinting on his white hair, great Uncle Mary scooped up their two biggest suitcases, one under each arm, and strode across the yard to a car. What do you think of that? He demanded pr proudly. Following, they looked. It was a vast, battered estate car, with rusting mud guards and peeling paint. The mud caked on the hubs of the wheels. A s wisp of steam curled up from the radiator. Smashing, said Simon. Hmm, Mother said. Well, Mary, Father said cheerfully, I hope you're well insured. Great Uncle Mary snorted. Nonsense. Splendid vehicle. Hired her from a farmer. She'll hold us all anyway. And you get... Jane glanced regretfully at the back at the station entrance as she clambered in after the rest. The red-haired dog was standing on the pavement watching them, long pink tongue dangling over white teeth. Great Uncle Mary called. Come on, Rufus. Oh, Barry said in delight as a flurry of long legs and wet muzzles shot through the door and knocked him sideways. Does he belong to you? Heaven forbid, Great Uncle Mary said, but I suppose he'll belong to your th you three for the next month. The captain wouldn't take him aboard, so Rufus gets so Rufus goes with the grey house. He folded himself into the driving seat. The grey house, Simon said. Is that what it's called? Why? Wait and see. The engine gave a hiccup and a roar, and then they were away. Through the streets and out of the town, they thundered in the lurching car until hedges took the place of houses, thick, wild hedges, growing high and green as the road wound uphill. And behind them, the grass swept sweeping up to the sky and against the sky they saw nothing but lonely trees stunted and bowed by the wind that blew from the sea and yellow gray outcrops of rock there you are great uncle mary shouted over the noise he turned his head and waved one arm away from the steering wheel so that father moaned softly and hid his eyes now you're in cornwall the real cornwall logress is behind you is before you before you yeah I don't know if I'm saying that town's name right either. Okay, bear with me. The clatter was too loud for anyone to call back. What's he mean, Logress? demanded Jane. Simon shook his head and the dog licked his ear. He means the land of the West, Barney said unexpectedly, pushing back the forelock of fair hair that always tumbled over his eyes. It's the old name for Cornwall, Cornwall King Arthur's name. Simon groaned. I might have known. Ever since he had learned to read, Barney's greatest heroes have been King Arthur and his knights kindred spirit. In his dreams, he fought imaginary battles as a member of the round table, rescuing fair ladies and slaying false knights. He had been longing to come to the West Country. It gave him a strange feeling that they would someday be coming home, that he would in some way be coming home. He said resentfully, you wait, great uncle Mary knows. And then after what seemed like a long time, the hills gave way to the long blue line of sea and the village was before them. Trowisic seemed to be sleeping beneath its gray, slate-tiled roofs, along, with the along the narrow winding streets down the hill. Silent behind their lace curtain windows, the little square houses let the roar of the car bounce back from their whitewashed walls. Then Great Uncle Mary swung the wheel round, and suddenly they were driving along the edge of the harbor, past water rippling and flashing golden in the afternoon sun. Sailing dinghies bobbed in their moorings along the quay, and a whole row of Cornish fishing boats that they had only seen only in pictures painted by their mother years before, stocky workmen like boats, each with a stubby mast and a small square engine house at the stern. Nets hung dark over the harbor walls, and a few fishermen, hefty brown faced men in long boots that reached their thighs, glanced up idly as the car passed. Two or three grinned at Uncle Mary, at Great Uncle Mary, and waved. Do they know you? Simon said curiously. But Great Uncle Mary, who 
could become very deaf when he chose not to answer a question, only roared on along the road that curved up the hill, high over the other side of the harbor, and suddenly stopped. Here we are, he said. In the abrupt silence, their ears still numb from the thundering engine, they all turned from the sea to look at the other side of the road. They saw a terrace of houses, sloping sideways up the steep hill, and in the middle of them, rising up like a tower, one tall, narrow house with three rows of grey windows and a gabled roof. A sombre house, painted dark grey, with the door and window frames shining white. The roof was slate-tiled, a high blue-grey arch facing out across the harbour to the sea. The grey house, Great Uncle Mary said. They could smell a strangeness in the breeze that blew faintly on their faces down the hill, a beckoning smell of salt and seaweed and excitement. As they unloaded suitcases from the car, with Rufus darting in an excited frenzy through everyone's legs, Simon suddenly clutched, clutched Jane by the arm. Gosh, look! He was pointing out to sea beyond the harbor mouth. Along his pointed finger, Jane saw the tall, graceful triangle of a yacht under full sail, moving lazily towards Creswick. Creswick. Pretty, she said, with only mild enthusiasm. She did not share Simon's passion for boats. She's a beauty. Wonder who she is. Who she is? Simon stood, watching, entranced. The yacht crept nearer, her sails beginning to flap, and when the tall white mainsail crumpled and dropped, they heard the rattle of breaking very, very faint across the water and the throaty cough of an engine. Mother says we can go down and look at the harbor before supper, Barney said behind them. Coming? Of course. Will Great Uncle Mary come along? He's going to put the car away. They set off down the hill, down the road, leading to the quay beside a low gray wall with tufts of grass and pink valer valerian growing between its stones. In a few places, Jane found she had forgotten her handkerchief, and she, in a few paces, Jane found she had forgotten her handkerchief, and she ran back to retrieve it from the car. Scrabbling on the floor by the back seat, she glanced up, stared for a moment through the windscreen, surprised. Great Uncle Mary, coming back towards the car from the gray house, had suddenly stopped in his tracks in the middle of the road. He was gazing down at the sea, and she realized he had caught sight of the yacht. What startled her was the expression on his face. Standing there like a craggy, towering statue, he was frowning, fierce and intense, almost as if he were looking and listening with senses other than his eyes and ears. He could never look frightened, she thought, but this was the nearest thing to it that she had ever seen. Cautious, startled, alarmed. What was the matter with him? Was there something strange about the yacht? Then he turned and went quickly back to the house. Jane emerged thoughtfully from the car to follow the boys down the hill. The harbor was almost deserted. The sun was hot on their faces, and they felt the warmth of the stone quay side strike at their feet through their sandal soles. In the center, in front of the tall warehouse, wooden warehouse doors, the quay jutted out square into the water. A great heap of empty boxes towered above their heads. Three seagulls walked tolerantly to the edge out of their way. Before them, a small forest of spars and ropes swayed. The tide was only half high, and the decks of the moored boats were down below the quay side out of sight. Hey, Simon said, pointing through the harbor entrance. That yacht's come in. Look, isn't she marvelous? The slim white boat sat at anchor beyond the harbor wall, protected from the open sea by the headland on which the gray house stood. Jane said, Do you think there's anything odd about her? Odd? Why should there, why should there be? Oh, I don't know. Perhaps she belongs to the harbor master, Barney said. Places this size don't have harbor masters, he little... Oh, places this size don't have harbor masters, you little fathead. Only ports like father went to in the navy. Oh, yes, they do, clever sticks. There's a little black door on the corner over there marked harbor master's office. Barney hopped triumphantly up and down and frightened a seagull away. It ran a few steps and then flew off, flapping low over the water and bleeding into the distance. Oh, well, Simon said amiably, shoveling his hands in his pockets and standing on with his legs apart, rocking his heels in his captain-on-the-bridge stance. One up. Still, that boat must belong to someone pretty rich. You could cross the channel in her. Or even the Atlantic. A hug, said Jim. Jane. 
Hug, said Jane. She swam as well as anybody, but she was the only member of the Drew family who disliked the open sea. Fancy crossing the Atlantic in the thing that size. Simon grinned wickedly, smashing. Great big waves picking you up and bringing you down. Swoosh. Everything falling about. Pots, pans upsetting in the galley. And the deck going up and down, up and down. You'll make her sick, Barney said calmly. Rubbish on dry land out here in the sun. Yes, you will. She looks a bit green already. Look. I don't. Oh, yes, you do. I think... I can't think why you weren't ill in the train like you usually are. Just think of those waves in the Atlantic and the mass swaying about and nobody in the... And nobody with an appetite for their breakfast except me. Oh, shut up. I'm not going to listen. And poor Jane turned and ran round the side of the mountain of fishy-smelling boxes, which had probably been having more effect on her imagination than the thought of the sea. Girls, Simon said cheerfully. There was a sudden and ear-splitting crash from the other side of the boxes. A scream and a noise of metal jingling on concrete. Simon and Barney gazed horrified at one another for a moment and rushed around to the other side. Jane was lying on the ground with a bicycle on top of her, his front wheel still spinning round. A dark-haired boy lay sprawled across the quay not far away. A box of tins and packets of food had spilled from the bicycle carrier, and milk was trickling in a white puddle from a broken bottle splintered in the glittering sun. The boy scrambled to his feet, glaring at Jane. He was in all-navy blue, his trousers tucked into Wellington boots. He had a sh short, thick neck and a strangely flat face, twisted now with, an, with ill temper. We now have a um, phonetically written um, stuff, so I'm just going to do this <laughs> the best I can, because I don't know what a Cornish accent is supposed to sound like. Look where he's going, Canny. <laughs> he snarled the Cornish accent made ugly by anger. Get out of me way. I'm so sorry. <laughs> he jerked the bicycle upright, taking no heed of Jane. The pedal caught her ankle and she winced with pain. It wasn't my fault, she said with some spirit. You came rushing up without looking where you were going. Barney crossed to her in silence and helped her to her feet. The boy suddenly began picking up his spilled tins and slamming them back into the box. Jane picked up one to help, but as she reached toward the box, the boy knocked her hand away, sending the tin spinning across the quay. Leave him alone, he growled. Look here, Simon said indignantly. There's no need for that. Shut your mouth, said the boy shortly without even looking up. Shut your own, Simon said belligerently. Oh, Simon, don't, Jane said unhappily. If he wants to be beastly, let him. Her leg was stinging viciously and blood trickled down from a graze on her knee. Simon looked at her flushed face, hearing the strain in her voice. He bit his lip. The boy pushed his bicycle to lean against the pile of boxes, scowling at Barney as he jumped nervously out of the way. Then rage suddenly snarled out of him again. Off! The lot of ye! He snapped. They had never heard the word he used. But the tone was unmistakable. And Simon went hot with resentment and clenched his fist to lunge forward, but Jane clutched him back. And the boy moved quickly to the edge of the quay and climbed down over the edge, facing them, the, boxes of, the box of groceries in his arms. They heard a thumping and clattering noise. Looking over the edge, they saw him lurching about in a row dinghy. He untied its mooring rope from a ring in the wall and began edging out through the other boats into the open harbor, standing up with one oar thrust down over the stern. Moving hastily and angrily, he clouded the dinghy hard against the side of one of the big fishing boats, but took no notice. Soon he was out in the open water, sculling rapidly one hand and glaring back at them in sneering contempt. As he did so, they heard the clatter of feet moving rapidly over hollow wood from inside the injured fishing boat. A small wizened figure popped up suddenly from a hatch in the deck and waved its arms about in fury, shouting over the water towards the boy in a surprisingly deep voice. The boy deliberately turned his back, still sculling, and the dinghy disappeared outside the harbor entrance, round the jutting wall. The little man shook his fist, then turned towards the quay, leaping neatly from the deck of one boat to another, until he reached the ladder on, in the wall and jumped up by the children's feet. He wore the inevitable navy blue jersey and trousers with long boots reaching up to his legs. Clumsy young limb, that Bill Hoover, he said crossly. What a like catching. 
That's all. Just wait. But then he suddenly seemed to realize that the children were more than just part of the quay. He grunted, flashing a quick glance at their tense faces, the blood on Jane's knee. Thought I heard voices from below, he said more gently. You've been having trouble with him. He jerked his head out to see. He knocked my sister over with his bike, Simon said indignantly. It was my fault, really. I made her run into him. But he was beastly rude, and he bashed Jane's hand away, and then he went off before I could hit him, he ended lamely. The old fisherman smiled at them. Ah, well, don't you take no count of him. He am a bad lot, that lad, evil-tempered as they come, and evil-minded with it. You keep away from him. We shall, Jem sa Jane said, with feeling rubbing her leg gingerly. The fisherman clicked his tongue. That's a nasty old cut you got there, my dear. You want to go and get him washed up? You am on holiday here, I dare say. We're staying in the Grey House, Simon said, up there on the hill. I am doing my best with this accent. I am so sorry. I'm sure it's not right at all. The fisherman glanced at him quickly, a flicker of interest passing over the passive brown wrinkled face. Are ye then? I wonder maybe. Then he stopped short, strangely as if he were quickly changing his mind about what he had been going to say. Simon, puzzled, waited for him to go on, but Barney, who had not been listening, turned round from where he was peering over the edge of the quay. Is that your boat out there? The fisherman looked at him, half taken aback and half amused as he would have looked at some small unexpected animal that barked. That's right, me handsome. That one I just come off. Do, don't the other fishermen mind you jumping over their boats? Yeah. Too far. The old man laughed, a cheerful rusty noise. I'd no other way to get ashore from there. Nobody minds you coming across their boats so long as you don't mark her. Are you going out fishing? Not for a while, my dear, said the fisherman amiably, putting a piece of dirty rag, pulling a piece of dirty rag from his pocket and scrubbing the oil marks on his hands. Go out with sundown, we do, and come back with the dawn. Barney beamed. I shall get up early and watch you come in. <laughs> Believe that when I see him, said the fisherman with a twinkle. Now look, you run and take your little sister home and wash that leg. Don't know what scales and muck got up into off here. He scuffed the quay with his glistening boot. Yes, come on, Jane, Simon said. He took one more look at the quiet line of boats, then put his hand up to peer into the sun. I say, that oaf with the bicycle. He's going on board the yacht. Jane and Barney looked. Out beyond the far harbor wall, a dark shape was bobbing against the long white hull of the silent yacht. They could see the boy climbing up the side and two figures meeting him on deck. Then all three disappeared, and the boat lay deserted again. Ah, said the fisherman, so that's it. Young Bill were buying stores and petrol and all yesterday, enough for a navy, but nobody could get it out of him who they, they was for. Tidy old boat, that, and cruising, I suppose. Can't see what he made all the mystery about. He began to walk along the quay, rolling a small figure with the folded tops of his boots slapping his legs at every step. Barney trotted beside him, talking earnestly, and rejoined the others at the corner of a small, the corner at the. Barney trotted beside him, talking earnestly, and rejoined the others at the corner as the old man, waving to them, turned off towards the village. His name's Mister Penhallow, and his boat's called the White Heather. He says they've got a hundred stone of pilchard last night, and they'll get more tomorrow because it's going to rain. One day you'll ask too many questions," said Jane. "Rain," said Simon incredulously, looking up at the blue sky. That's what he said. Rubbish. He must be nuts. I bet he's right. Fishermen always know things, especially Cornish fishermen. You ask Great Uncle Mary. But Great Uncle Mary, when they sat down to their first supper in the Grey House, was not there. Only their parents and the beaming red-cheeked village woman, Mrs. Polk, who was to come in every day to help with the cooking and cleaning. Great Uncle Mary had gone away. He must have said something, Jane said. Father shrugged. Not really. He just muttered about having to go and look for something and roared off in the car like a thunderbolt. But we've only just got here, Simon said hurt. Never mind, Mother said comfort comfortably. Okay. You know what he is. He'll be back in his own good time. Barney gazed dreamily at the Cornish pasties Miss pa Mrs. Polk had made for their supper. He's gone on a quest. It might take years and years. 
can search and search on a quest, and in the end, you'll never get there at all. Quest my foot, Simon said irritably. He's just gone chasing after some stupid old tomb in a church or something. Why couldn't he have told us? I expect he'll be back in the morning, Jane said. She looked out the window, across the low gray wall edging the road. The light was beginning to die, and as the sun sank behind their headland, the sea was turning to a dark gray green and the slow mist creeping into the harbor. Though the oh, through the growing haze she saw a dim shape move down on the water, and above it a brief flash of light. First a red pinprick in the gloom, and then a green and white points of light above both. She sat up suddenly as she realized she could see it was the mysterious white yacht moving out of Trowisic, moving out of Trowisic Harbor as silently and as strangely as it had come. Uh, how long is chapter two? Uh, not too bad. I can probably just do two chapters though, because these ones are a lot longer than something wicked this way comes were. And now I have a cat on my lap. Look at him. All right. Chapter two. The next day, as they sat eating breakfast, Great Uncle Mary came back. He loomed in the doorway, tall and hollow-eyed under the thatch of white hair, and beamed at their surprised faces. Good morning, he said cheerfully. Any coffee left? The ornaments seemed to rattle in the mantelpiece as he spoke. Great Uncle Mary always gave him the impression of being far too big for any room he was in. Father reached out imperturbably to put on up another chair. What's it like out this morning, Mary? Doesn't look so good to me. Great Uncle Mary sat down and helped himself to a toast, to toast, holding the slice in one large palm while he spread butter on it with Father's knife. Cloud. Thick. Coming in from the sea. We're going to have rain. Barney was fidgeting with the unbearable curiosity, suddenly forgetting the family rule that they should never ask their mysterious great-uncle questions about himself. He burst out, Gamary, where have you been? In the heat of the moment, he used the pet name which he had invented when... He was very small. They all used it sometimes still, but not for every day. Jane hissed quietly between her teeth, and Simon glared at him across the table, but great-uncle Mary seemed not to have heard. It may not last, he went on conversationally to father, through a mouthful of toast, but I think we shall have it for most of the day. Will there be thunder? Jane said. Simon added, hopefully. Shall we have a storm at sea? Barney sat silent while their voices eddied around the table. The weather, he said to himself in exasperation, all of them talking about the weather when great uncle Mary's just come back from his quest. Then, over their voices, there came a low rumble of thunder. It was the first and the first spattering sounds of rain. As everyone rushed to the window to look out at the heavy gray sky, Barney crossed unnoticed to his great uncle and slipped his hand into his for a moment. Good Mary, he said softly. Did you find it, what you were looking for? He expected great uncle Mary to look past him with the familiar, amiable, obstinate expression that greeted any question. But the big man looked down at him, almost absently. The eyebrows were drawn forbiddingly together on the craggy, secret face, and there was uh, the old fierceness in the dark hollows and lines. He, had sa he said gently, No, Barnabas, I didn't find it this time. Then it was as if a blanket came down over his face again. I must go and put the car away, he called to father and went out. The thunder rolled quietly, far out over the sea. But the rain fell with great inst insistence. Insistence. Yep, that's the word. Blurring the windows as it washed down outside. The children wandered aimlessly about the house. Before lunch, they tried going for a walk in the rain, but came back damp and depressed. Halfway through the afternoon, Mother put her head around the door. I'm going upstairs to work for until supper. Now look, you three, you can't go anywhere you like in the house. You can go anywhere you like in the house, but you must promise not to touch anything that's obviously been put away. Everything valuable is all locked up, but I don't want you poking at anyone's private papers or belongings, all right? 
We promise, Jane said, and Simon nodded. A little while, Father muffled himself in a big black oilskin and went off through the rain to see the harbor master. Jane wandered round the bookshelves, but all the books within reach seemed to have titles like Round the Horn or Log Book of the Virtue, 1886, and she thought them very dull. Simon, who'd been sitting making darts out of the morning paper, suddenly crumpled them up, crumpled all, them all up irritably. I'm fed up with this. What shall we do? Barney stared gloomily out of the window. It's raining like anything. The water in the harbor is all flat, and on our first proper day, oh, I hate the rain. I hate it, I hate it, I hate the rain, he began to chant remor morosely. Simon prowled restlessly around the room, looking at the pictures in the dark, pa dark wallpaper. It's a very dreary house when you're shut up inside. He doesn't seem to think about anything but the sea, does he, the captain? This time last year, you were going to be a sailor, too. Well, I changed my mind. Oh, well, I don't know. Anyway, I was going... I, anyway, I should go on a destroyer, not the potty little sailing ship like that one. What is it? He peered up at the, description under the, at the inscription under the engraving. The Golden Hind. That was Drake's ship when he sailed to America and discovered Potato. That was Raleigh. Oh, well, said Barney, who didn't really care. What useless things they discover, Simon said critically. I shouldn't have bothered about vegetables. I should have come back w loaded with doubloons and diamonds and pearls. And apes and peacocks, said Jane, har harking vaguely back to a poetry lesson at school. And I should have gone exploring into the interior, and the rude natives would have turned me into a god and tried to offer me their wives. Why would the natives be rude, said Barney. Not that sort of rune, you idi rude, you idiot. It means... It means... Well, it's the sort of thing natives are. It's what all the explorers call them. This book was written in uh, 1965. I just want to point that out. There are some things that did not age well. <laughs> uh, let's be explorers, Jane said. We can explore the house. We haven't yet, not properly. It's like a strange land. We can work from the bottom all the way up to the top. And we should have to take provisions with us, so we can have a picnic when we get there, said Barney, brightening. We haven't got any. We can ask Mrs. Polk, said Jane. She's making cakes for Mother in the kitchen. Come on. Mrs. Polk in the kitchen laughed all over her red face and said, What will he think of next, I wonder? But she gave them, neatly wrapped it, wrapped a f stack of freshly baked scones and cut in half, thickly buttered, and put t together again. A pack of squashed fly biscuits. I don't know what that means. Three apples and a great slab of dark yellow-orange cake, thick and crumbling with fruit. And something to drink, said Simon Commanding, already captain of the expedition. So Mrs. Polk, good-humoredly, added a big bottle of homemade lemonade. To finish it off. There, she said. That'll take ye to St. Ives and back, I reckon. My rucksack's upstairs, said Simon. I'll get it. Oh, really, said Jane, who was beginning to feel a little foolish. We aren't even going outdoors. All explorers have rucksacks, Simon said, severely making for the door. I won't be a minute. Barney nibbled at some of the yellow cake crumbs from the table. This is smashing. Saffron cake, Mrs. Saffron cake, Mrs. Polk said proudly. Proudly. You won't get that in London. Mrs. Polk, where's Rufus? Gone out, and a good job, too, though I dare say we shall have his great wet feet all over the floor for long. The professor took him out for a walk. Now stop picking at that cake, my, my dear, or you'll spoil that picnic of yours. Simon came back with his rucksack. They filled it and went out on, into the dark pa into the little dark passage away from the kitchen. Mrs. Polk waved them farewell as solemnly as if they were off to the North Pole. Who did she say... Had taken Rufus for a walk, said Jane. Great Uncle Mary, Barney said. They all call him the professor, didn't you know? Mr. Penhollow did as well. They all talk as if they'd known him for years. They were on the first floor landing, long and dark, and lit only from a small window. Jane waved her hand at the big wooden chest half hidden in one corner. What's that? It's locked, said Simon, trying the lid. One of the things we mustn't touch, I suppose. Actually, it's full of native golden ornaments. We'll collect it all on the way back. Stow it in the hold. 
Who's going to carry it? demanded Barney practically. Easy. We've got a string of native porters all walking behind in a row and calling me boss. Catch me calling you boss. Actually, you ought to be the cabin boy and call me sir. Aye, aye, sir, Simon billowed suddenly. Shut up, said Jane. Mother's working at the other end of the landing. You'll make her do a smudge. What's in there? Barney said. There was a dark door in the shadows at the far end of the landing. I haven't noticed it before. He turned the handle and the door opened outward with a slow creak. I say, there's another little corridor down some steps. And a door at the end of it. Come on. They went down over the worn carpet beneath rows of old maps hanging in the, on the walls. The little corridor, like all the house, had a smell of furniture polish and age and sea, and yet nothing like these things really, but just the smell of strangeness. Hey, said Simon before, as Barney reached for the door, I'm captain, I'll go first. There might be cannibals. Cannibals, said Barney with scorn, but he let Simon open the door. It was an odd little room, very small and bare, with one round leaded window looking out inland across the great gray slate roofs and fields. There was a bed in a red and white gingham cover coverlet, and a wooden chair, a wardrobe, and a washstand with an outsized willow pattern bowl, and ewer? E W E R. Uh, and that was all. Well, that's not very interesting, said Jane, disappointed. She looked about, feeling something was missing. Look, there isn't even a carpet, just a bare floor. Barney padded across the window. What's this? He picked up something from the windowsill, long and dark with a glint of brass. It's a sort of tube. Simon took it from him and turned it around curiously. It's a telescope in a case. He unscrewed it. He unscrewed the case so that it came apart in two halves. No, it's not. What a swizz. It's just a case with nothing inside. Excuse me. Now I know what this ship, or what this room reminds me of, Jane said suddenly. It's like the cabin in a ship. That window looks like a porthole. I think we mu it must be the captain's bedroom. We ought to take the telescope with us in case we lose our way, said Simon, holding it made him feel pleasantly important. Don't be silly. It's just an empty case, Jane said. Anyway, it's not ours. Put it back. Simon scowled at her. I mean, Jane said hastily, we are in the jungle, not at sea, so there are landmarks. Oh, all right. Simon put down the case reluctantly. They emerged from the little dark corridor, its door, and they closed it behind them, vanishing once more into the shadows so that they could hardly see where it had been. Not much else he here. That one's Great Uncle Mary's bedroom, and there's the bathroom on this side of it, and Mother's studio room the other. What an odd way this house is built, Simon said as they turned into another narrow corridor towards the stairs leading up the next floor. All little bits joined together by funny little passages, as if each bit were meant to be kept secret from the next. Barney looked round him in the dim light, tapping at the half-paneled walls. It's all very solid. There ought to be secret panels and things, secret entrances to nat into native treasure caves. Well, we haven't... But well, we haven't finished yet. Simon led the way up the stairs to a familiar top landing, where their bedrooms were. Is it getting dark? I suppose it's the low clouds. Barney squatted at the top stair. We ought to have tor we ought to have torches, burning brands, to the to light the path and keep the wild animals off. Only we couldn't because there are hostile natives all around, and they'd see. Simon took over. Somehow, imagination worked easily in the friendly silence of the gray house. Actually, they're already after us, creeping along our tracks up the hill. We'll be able to hear their feet rustling soon. We ought to hide, make camp somewhere, and they can't get at that. They can't get at in one of the bedrooms. They're all caves. I can hear them breathing. Barney said, gazing down dark stairs into the shadows. He was half beginning to believe it. The obvious caves won't do. Simon said, remembering he was in command. They'd look there first of all. He crossed the landing and began thoughtfully opening and shutting doors. Mother's and father's room? No. Good, very ordinary cave. Cave. Jane's? Just the same. Bathroom? Our room? No escape route anywhere. We shall all be turned into sacrifices and eaten. Boiled, said Barney. Sep ah, sepulchrally? In a great big pot. Perhaps there's another door. I mean cave. Like, one we haven't noticed. 
I mean cave, that we haven't noticed, like the one downstairs. Jane peered round the darkest end of the landing beside her brother's door, but the passage came to a dead end, the wall running unbroken round all three sides. There ought to be one. After all, the house goes straight out, do straight up, doesn't it? And there's a door directly underneath here, she pointed to the blank wall, and a room behind it, so there ought to be a door, th there ought to be a room the same size behind this wall. Simon became interested. You're quite right, but there isn't any door. Perhaps there's a secret panel, Barney said hopefully. You read too many books. Have you ever seen a real secret panel in a real house? Anyway, there isn't any paneling on this wall, just wallpaper. Your room's on the other side, Jane said. Is there a door in there? Simon shook his head. Barney opened the door into their room and went in, kicking his slippers under the bed as he went past. Then he stopped suddenly. Hey, come in here. What's the matter? There's a bit between our bed where the wall makes a sort of alcove for the wardrobe. What's on the other side? Well, the landing, of course. It can't be. There's too much wall in here. You stand in the doorway and look both sides. The landing stops before it gets that far. Our, I'll bang on the wall where it stops, and you listen in here, said Jane. She went outside, pulling the door shut. They heard a faint tapping on the wall just over the head of Barney's bed. There you are, Barney said, hopping with excitement. The landing only reaches to there, but the wall in here goes on for yards, right over your bed to the window. So there must be a room on the other side. Jane came back to the bedroom. The wall doesn't look nearly as long out there as it does in here. It isn't, and I think that means, Simon said slowly, that there must be a door behind the wardrobe. Well, that finishes it then, Jane said, disappointed. Oh, well, that finishes it then, Jane said, disappointed. God damn it. That wardrobe's enormous. We shall never be able to move it. I don't see why not, Simon said. Simon looked thoughtfully at the wardrobe. We shall all have to pull it from down low so the top doesn't overbalance. If we all pull at one end, perhaps it'll swing round. Come on, then, said Jane. You and I pull and Barney hold the top and shout if he feels it overbalancing. They both bent and heaved the nearest leg of the wardrobe. Nothing happened. I think the stupid thing's nailed to the floor, Jane said in disgust. No, it's not. Come on, once more. One, two, three, heave! The great wooden tower squeaked unwillingly, a few inches across the floor. Go on, go on, it's coming! Barney could st hardly stand still. Simon and Jane tugged and puffed and blew their sneak and blew their sneakers slithering on the linoleum, and gradually the wardrobe moved out at an angle from the wall. Barney, peering into the gloom behind, suddenly shrieked, "There it is! There is a door!" Oh, f he staggered backwards, gasped, and sneezed. It's all covered in dust and cobwebs. It can't have been opened for years. Well, go on and try it, panted Simon, pink with breathlessness and success. I hope it doesn't open toward us, Jane said, sitting weakly on the floor. I can't pull this thing another inch. It doesn't, Barney said, muffled from behind the wardrobe. They heard the door creak, protestingly open. Then he reappeared, a large, dark smudge down one cheek. There isn't a room, it's a staircase. More like a ladder, really. It goes up into some sort of hatchway and there's a light up there. He looked at Simon with a crooked grin. You can go first, boss. <laughs> one by one, they slipped behind the wardrobe and through the little hidden door. Inside, it was at first very dark and Simon, blinking, saw before him a wide stepladder, steeply slanting, rising towards a dimly lit square beyond which he could see nothing. The steps were thick with dust, and for a moment he felt nervous about disturbing the stillness. Then, very faintly, he heard above his head the low, familiar murmur of the sea outside. At once, the comfortable noise made him more cheerful, and he even remembered what they were supposed to be. Last one up, shut the door, he called down over his shoulder. Keep the natives at bay. And he began to climb the ladder. gonna be enough for me tonight simply because um it is a work night for me and i was mostly reading to uh give my apartment time to cool down because i forgot to leave the window open so that'll be all uh and yeah i hope you enjoyed i look forward to reading more of this and <laughs> although quite a bit of it i know didn't age well hopefully most of it does i i do think it's a fun adventure story and it is mostly about king arthur so, but we don't really get into that until later. Um, yeah. Look forward to it. I'll see you guys next time.